Hey everybody, I am here with Keith, creator of the monoscope pattern for the 240p test suite and fellow CRT nerd slash retro enthusiast. How are you doing, Keith? I'm all right. How are you? Excellent. So I've been following your work since Artemio first introduced me to it. Um, and then, of course, I've following you on social media and seeing all the awesome stuff that you've been into. But uh, uh, impressive work. Thank you for the monoscope pattern, by the way. I mean, I, I'm not sure how I ended up there. Uh, I, besides just, uh, stumbling upon it on accident. Oh yeah. Um, so do you I have had, a background in like in calibration well, and design? Well, and I mean, like sort of, cause I had a background in photography, so I was already like paranoid about calibration just for editing, just for photo mm. editing, you know, making sure my display was good. And then of course I was enough of a sort of movie nerd to want my TV to look as good as possible, you know, like I go out and see a movie in a theater and I come home and I want to watch the same movie at some point and, you know, try to close that gap. That sort of thing. Yeah. So th that was already in the back of my head, but what, um, what got me to that point was just working on some CRTs that I did have already mm -hmm. and trying to buy, different random weird pattern generators on eBay. And yeah. And most of those were composite video, right? Yeah. All of that stuff has to be composite video. Why? Uh, Why all is those that? old ones. Um, well, actually some of them, some of the ones I have have composite and RF. Huh. Cause you're um, depending on how old your TV is when you do the calibration. Sometimes it even has to be like the primary signal that you base everything else off of is RF. If it's an old enough TV, but wow. uh because I Usually had a little like, Articos that um, it broke. I brought it to a local repair shop, um, mm -hmm. which was, you know, remember, that's like a 200 pound thing. I'm waddling my fat ass to get yeah. it in my car yeah. and get it all the way back after it was done. And everything was off everything. So I called the place. I was like, hey, what's going on? Did you forget to calibrate it? And they said, oh, maybe we'll, you know, we'll send somebody over. And I have this beautiful 1080i HD CRT. And they mm -hmm. plug in composite video to do the calibration. And that I, remember, I mean, this was the mid 2000s. I remember thinking. What on earth are you doing? But I, I didn't say anything. You well, know? I'm one. Well, it depends on which model it is. Obviously, at that point, you're doing you're dealing with HD inputs. Maybe the basis is supposed to be components. Maybe it's supposed to be composite just for that raw uh, monochrome white balance. Mm. Um, and that maybe the uh, component input or the HDMI input is like an offset. So, like first, you have to get composite right, and then when you huh. do like component video the adjustments for that are referencing the composite white balance, something like that. So it just so when you on... use your monoscope pattern on your RGB monitors, would you mm -hmm. start with the composite out and then verify it again with RGB or you just use RGB? That depends on the monitor as well, because if you have something like a 1342Q, you know, like an older uh, mm -hmm. fiddly knob Sony PVM, the geometry settings for that are universal. Every input, it all uses the same geometry settings. So you only have to do that once. Huh. But uh, uh, like a 14L5 or a 20L5, the geometry settings are uh, different for every single resolution and every single input. So Both awesome you and can, frustrating. <laughs> yeah, it takes a lot of work, a lot of work to get one of those actually behaving itself at every resolution and with every input all jiving together. Uh, sort of in harmony it takes a lot of work to do that properly so did you do that to yours did you actually go through every yeah. resolution That's pretty much uh <laughs> now obviously i can't do that with the monoscope for 240p test suite a lot of the time i'll use established hd patterns from a disc mm -hmm. like on a blu-ray player something like that because that's yeah more often than not that's what i'm going to be using like 1080i4 on a l5 is to watch a blu-ray movie so when you're, uh, you know, to, to everybody who's listening, I'm jumping all over the place because I'm excited <laughs> and I want to talk about all this stuff, but we'll swing back around for some explanation after. But when you're watching movies on a CRT, what is the resolution you go for? Because the one I love 480p, even with Blu-rays, I'll put them through mm -hmm. my PS3 and downscale them because mm -hmm. I feel like it's that happy medium of progressive scan sharpness, but mm -hmm. you still get to feel like there's a scan line mask in front of you. And when I go to 720p, it's like it almost is like I'm watching something on a flat panel with bad geometry, not bad, you know, <laughs> bad for Maybe. a flat panel. Right. You know, not um, 
I've actually I've actually gotten hooked on watching Blu-ray movies at 1080i on my L5. Um, mostly, I'm at that point. What I'm looking at is the improvement in motion mm. uh, over, say, like my OLED. Like I could watch a 4K movie disc, you know, on my PS5 or something to my LG OLED, and I can still see the motion artifacts. Mm-hmm. You know, even though I have all that crap turned off, it's mostly that sample and hold. You know, like um, the, the the panels too fast, basically. Yeah. And sometimes it's predicting the next frame and it shouldn't be or something weird like that. Or something's left over from the, 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 the frame refresh or something. But uh, it's even worse, like when you're streaming. I can't stand mm. it. it. Drives me crazy. But yeah. sometimes it's the color, too. Sometimes I wonder how many of the last the movies from the last 10 years or so were still mastered on BVMs. Because you look at, like, um, what was it? Uh, Alita Battle Angel. Mm-hmm. The the special effects on that on a CRT or at least on my fourteen L five look more in tune with the scene where they kind of stick out a little bit on my uh, like the four K version on my OLED like you can sort of tell there's a different slightly different color to the live action bits and the CG bits and they don't jive the same way that they do on that's my really OLED. interesting because back when Flat panels were, you know, maybe 2006 to 2010. I did, I was at CES every year for my job. I was, you know, at uh-huh. Cedia, all these home automation things. I got to demo all of these crazy different displays. And uh-huh. that was that weird period of time where rear projection TVs had about one year, maybe a year and a half, where people were, the companies were kind of pimping those as how oh, here's what you need to use for your calibration. You don't use an LCD, you use this. And mm-hmm. everybody I knew in the industry was like, no, <laughs> no, yeah. we're still going to use yeah. our CRT. <laughs> you could take your rear projection $15,000 JVC and shove it. But mm-hmm. I, it, was, it was impressive for what it was. But yeah. even then in that moment, they were still looking to the next gen. You know, they were stuck mm-hmm. with stuck with CRTs. I say stuck with because obviously it's a lot of work to keep those things perfect versus a flat panel. Yeah. But they were looking at plasma. And uh, remember, did you ever see SED TV demoed? where each pixel was its own CRT type of thing. No, a, I didn't see that at all. It was a Canon Toshiba joint venture. And uh-huh. um, the rumor, this is all bullshit. This could be flat earth theory right here. But <laughs> the rumor is it tanked because um, one of the companies had already, I think it was Toshiba had already invested so much money in an LCD plant that they didn't want to spend the billion dollars to build the other plant that they had signed. They had signed a contract that they were going to. I saw it in person. Right. I demoed it, saw it with my own eyes. Um, so they, they used some kind of patent thing to get around it. Like, Oh, you're right. you know, infringing on this. So we can't, but that was bad shit. Crazy good back then. It's the Nintendo PlayStation all over again. Yeah, basically, basically. <laughs> so yeah, that's funny. I, I'm I'm really curious now. I wonder if there's anybody out there that still calibrates on something like a BBM. I don't know. I mean, maybe it's just you know the CRT is flattening out everything. You know, because you're limited by the phosphorus. The phosphorus color is. I certainly find that getting. all the time. Yeah. Um. So that might be part of it, but I keep seeing these. You know, like I buy a 4K Blu-ray and mm-hmm. and I watch it on my OLED. I'm like, that looks great. And then I'll grab the newly remastered Blu-ray that came with it, watch it on my CRT, and the 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 uh, special effects just look more natural every time. Like uh, the Lord of the Rings. Uh, really? Like the uh, there's a lot of those composite shots where they had like uh, either CG or miniatures composited into some other miniature that they shot like a like a panning shot or something like that and you can tell when you watch it on like a on an oled you're like okay here's this layer and here's this layer like you can see the movie magic like behind yes. the curtain sort of thing but oh, then absolutely. i watched it on the l5 and i was like oh this looks right i think what my guess is my gut is that you're seeing one of the main reasons i still love watching a lot of stuff on crts is that it does the way it draws the image all that stuff kind of blends in and plasma Mm -hmm. was very similar in that it was Mm -hmm. ultra sharp it was a beautiful picture but a lot of that blended into each other better yeah i mean i'm sure you've seen zoomed in pictures of what a plasma looks like it almost looks like that plasma burn flicker thing Mm -hmm. and i think that helps blend a lot of the stuff together and that's actually how i watched all of the lord of the rings movies 3d on Mm -hmm. a plasma so Mm -hmm. nice yeah it's pretty cool 
for me personally, um, newer movies, I always just watch on my OLED or my projector, but like I was watching the, a couple of the first season X files episodes and watching that in 480p on the D32 BVM sitting right behind Mm -hmm. me now, it's actually pulled off the shelves so I could watch TV on it. it, uh, Yeah. Mind blowingly amazing. But now that you've said that you started watching these in 1080i, I think I got to try that next. I'll really short an episode in 480p that are half in 1080i. Yeah. yeah, it's really it's 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 quite nice. I mean, the other thing I've been attracted to is um, what I really want to find is one of those old professional, almost like rack mount DVD players. Yeah. That um, will do region one and two DVDs and output NTSC and PAL. Mm. And then actually watch original Doctor Who PAL DVDs on a, you know, PVM that I have that can accept PAL so I can watch it in the original sort of resolution, original frame rate, see if there's any difference versus watching their so, sort of like transmuted NTSC DVDs, something like that. Yeah. Just, so there's uh, the brand Oppo who does not make, um, I think they mm-hmm. just make phones now. They don't make pl- the players anymore. A lot of their DVD players and Blu-ray players had a source direct mode. So mm-hmm. on the BDP 93, it was just a button. So, you know, you've, yeah. you have it set to your target resolution, whatever. And then you hit that and they, they used, I, I want to say it was an HDMI logic analyzer, but I could be full of shit, but I, I definitely mm-hmm. know that multiple reviewers put in test discs at different resolutions and what mm-hmm. the test disc spit out was exactly what was on the disc. Source right. direct was a true source direct mode. So that that is certainly something to consider for that content. And I know they could be region modded, but I don't know if they handle NTSC and PAL. But that's certainly mm-hmm. something to look into. I know that I've seen these little they're like they're almost like the same size as a vector scope DVD mm-hmm. players that went into like a like a professional environment that could output NTSC and PAL, but I think some of them were only region one. So I don't know why they would I don't it doesn't make sense, but that's just reading documentation, so I don't know if it's accurate. But I've seen some yeah. of those like that on eBay that are like 70 bucks. So I know for a fact that my I had the BDP-93 and the UDP-203 is the one I think I have sitting over there. And they absolutely will play PAL content. And if you do the mm-hmm. mod, it will play all region discs. But I don't know if it's changing the PAL content to NTSC or if I'm getting a true PAL output of it. Yeah, that's an interesting – I mean just – that's what I get for being an American that likes Doctor Who, right? <laughs> yeah. I like a lot of silly British TV shows. Space, yeah. I laughed so hard at that one. Um, Ab Fab, oh my God. I can oh God, watch that, yeah. rewatch that show every year. Every time yeah. they fall out of a car, I near piss myself. Love that show. Mm-hmm. But, <laughs> so yeah, I get, I get what you mean. I'd love, to, I'd love to see that as well. But do you find that you see any kind of weird artifacts? And do you notice PAL to NTSC conversion when you're watching these DVDs? Um, sometimes I'll see a little bit of a motion thing. I think it's like, I'll, it's like they smoothed out the 50 Hertz signal to out to 60. However mm. they did it, you know, I'm, I'm not even sure what the source, like, did they shoot it on film? Was it 24 originally, or did they shoot it at 25 and doubled it to 50 for uh pal broadcast? Or was it a shot on video? Was it shot at 50? I don't know. Well, that's a good question. Like we should ask Dan cause he probably knows. He probably would. Yeah. I, you know, that's a fun experiment. I love, I drive my wife crazy with these experiments. Like, all right, we're going to watch half of the show in this and half the other. And I just got ab fab. There was, I found uh, the original DVD set for five bucks on eBay. And then the special edition that they just re-released was uh, like less than half price. So I was like, Oh, perfect. I get a fancy new one that looks fun up on the wall. And then Mm -hmm. I could do it supposedly was remastered. So we could watch half and half and see, but now I feel like, cause I have a BVM and the ability to play this stuff. I should uh, I should try to pick up a PAL version of that DVD as well and see if I yeah. can see a difference there watching it. I wonder how, I mean, because, so maybe I'm just tired and confused here, but if you're running a BVM or a PVM or a multi-format yeah. CRT in the US and you have a 50 hertz signal, is it still actually running at 50 hertz, true 50 hertz, even though the power is at 60 hertz? That's a good question. Um, Dan, Dan, where are you, buddy? Why yeah, you? right. Well, I would imagine that the power supply handles all that, right? You're yeah. going to input whatever it gets, and it's going to, like, uh, you know, the the display circuit separate from the, the power supply in a significant way that you can do those multi-format things. And it's not synchronized to the AC voltage, right? 
Actually, that's one of the reasons uh, all that equipment originally, you know, in the 50s or 60s or whatever, when they're developing it, it's why uh, the video and everything was all 60 hertz in the first place, is that you could use the AC voltage to synchronize everything. Right. Uh Uh-huh. I'll have to look into that. That makes sense. Because all the testing I've done has been video game related. Yeah. And it definitely runs at the slower speed. And I don't notice any artifacts, but I think I've spent handfuls of hours playing PAL content as opposed to the thousands of hours staring at mm-hmm. CRTs for you know retro yeah. RGB work and my own thing. So well, that's interesting. I mean, I well, even so- noticed a huge uh, bump. I bought like the uh, Ninth Doctor's season on DVD, just in the NTSE version. And, right, and watching that on a CRT compared to streaming it on HBO Max to like a flat panel. The mm. difference was night and day in almost every shot. Like, there's still some, like, wonky, you know, uh, special effect shots that were still bad. But there were a lot of them that once you kind of got away from uh, that format and got back to, like, a DVD on a CRT, it looked way more natural. And so I was yeah. just trying to push that further. It's like, well, there's extra resolution in PAL. And obviously the color formats for the cameras and everything were all kind of working together then it has to get translated for for the u.s you know what are we losing in that translation we're losing some resolution we're using we're probably losing some color accuracy Hmm. Uh, but uh, i don't know until i see it yeah i think that's worthy experiments to mess with the stuff so you know obviously i love nerding out about it i don't know why sometimes but i you know when you obsess over this stuff, you meaning all of us, right? When mm-hmm. we when we obsess over this stuff, sometimes it's just to, just because I like being a nerd and that's where the enjoyment is. But for yeah. things like what is my favorite way to watch my old TV shows, that's right. where it really starts to hit home. Like I had my my brother was over for the holidays and I had him do, uh, and you know we watched part of an X we watched like three X Files episodes and one of mm-hmm. it was a DVD on the thirty six inch JVC we a component video so way better than we could have seen it as kids but mm-hmm. fine um and then uh on the projector and then on the tv on the bvm and 480p now i wish i'd tried 1080i but like hands down both of us were like this is amazing like this is yeah. the way i want to watch this show for the rest of my life even though the blu-ray is amazing i thought they did a great job and the only mm-hmm. thing that really stands out is whatever stock footage they had to throw in it's like okay now it's fly across the country and it's a stock footage of a you know an right. old airplane that looks plane like landing total out. shit yeah exactly yeah. but other than that it was you know it was phenomenal and it really made a difference and it made all those hours i spent testing this crap worth it <laughs> right so. so to to circle back around um how exactly does one start to do something like create a monoscope pattern that's loaded into a test program like that um, there's a lot of fun math that I actually had to get taught. Um, our, like I said, when I sort of stumbled upon this stuff on accident, it was using some leader, uh, monoscope pattern generator. Well, actually it wasn't even a monoscope pattern generator. It was just a pattern generator. Um, it had like a cross hatch with a circle in the middle. Um, so basically if you could get the circle height and width equal, your mm. aspect ratio is going to be correct for, for video, for, for the CRT, no problem. But how much overscan was actually appropriate wasn't clear with that, with that pattern, which is why I went back to the well looking for something that had a specific monoscope pattern. I kept reading in Sony service manuals, like put up this monoscope image and cut off this much of it, you know, exactly. You know, they had specific numbers. They had specific intent for that sort of thing. And uh, I eventually found one, uh, Kenwood CG961. Hmm. And it had a very nice, high quality, like 1000 TV line rated monoscope pattern. Wow. So, you know, it's good for practically basically anything. I uh, imagine maybe some monoscope, not monoscope, monochrome like monitors uh, would have a higher TV account because it's black and white only. Right. You know, when you're do- when you're only doing Luma, it's going to be sharper than than trying to shoehorn in the color. Mm-hmm. But uh, otherwise, it's except for the one that the Sony L5 service menu manual specifically um, 
asks for, which is uh, some Shibasoku monoscope. And it's like a single purpose unit, like rack mount unit. I think hmm. I saw one guy selling one on eBay for 600 bucks. I was like, no thanks. <laughs> um, it was, but it was kind of in between that, trying to understand. Like, I had set it up, I had set the like horizontal size and the vertical size on that cross hatch um, to what I thought was pretty reasonable. You know, like, uh, according to that pattern generator, everything looked fine. And then I turned it off and turned on um, Super Nintendo. And there were big pillar bars on the sides. And I'm like, what's this about? Like, mm -hmm. I didn't even understand what was happening yet. And, I, like, I tried to maybe post around in a couple places, like, asking, like, hey, I did this. I set it up this way. And now the Super Nintendo looks like this. And, you know, the responses I got were not helpful. It was mostly, like, you don't know what you're doing or something like that. Um, just get a Raspberry Pi. <laughs> or something. I don't know. Like, you know, right. just. But I posted that originally, and then I got a message from i may have even asked artemio specifically like hey what's going on here and uh he invited me to his discord and i talked to a bunch of guys there about the math behind how those images are drawn you know mm -hmm. not only just the uh the graphics chip like the ppu or, or whatever it is but the supporting analog circuitry after that that actually turns it into composite or whatever it is mm -hmm. and uh basically how non-square pixels work and, and all that stuff. And, um, so I was learning that, but at the same time I was learning how to take care of the CRTs that are, I already had. I had mm -hmm. a PVM 2530 that I'd gotten in a great trade, like in 2012, something mm -hmm. like that. Um, I gave a guy the CDI Zeldas in exchange oh. <laughs> for a PVM 2530. That's what I, it was a straight That's funny. up trade. And they both skyrocketed in price. So it's still a fair trade today. Yeah. It's probably <laughs> still like a pretty decent exchange as far as that's concerned. I thought it was a great deal at the time. I probably only paid 50 bucks for them. <laughs> uh, so I thought it was a great deal. And I had known sort of long-term owning that. I was like, I'm sort of fiddling with it. I'll take the back off every couple of months when I'm brave. I'm like, what's going on in here? And I'm, you know, trying to understand it. Uh, but I knew long term I was going to have to learn how to take care of it properly. Mm. And uh, I did have some background. Um, I'd worked in a radio repair shop. So mm. I knew my way around tube electronics in principle. I'd built my own guitar amplifier from scratch, stuff nice. like that. Um, so I knew how to behave myself around high voltage and not, you know, give myself a heart attack. Mm. Um, of course, CRTs are a different class, but most of the same principles apply. Yeah. Um, but it was still like another step up in complexity from what I was used to. Cause I was doing hand wired, you know, tube amps, you know, like you do that with a baseball bat and, you know, <laughs> if you want to, but right. <laughs> you know, like it's a diff, it's definitely a different tool set to mm -hmm. work on PCBs to work on that sort of thing. So it just ended up the, that the beginning of the lockdowns, so I was like, I'm going to just teach myself how to do this. Mm -hmm. Like, well, I'm trapped in my house just like everybody else. Like, let's find something constructive to do. You know, most of my photography work was outdoors and uh, that kind of got scuttled uh, in Chicago. I mean, they even closed down the, uh, the public parks. You couldn't go outside for anything. Like, you could go to the grocery store. That was it. Um, so forget going to do landscape photography or cityscapes or, or shooting street nobody's out doesn't matter uh nobody's getting portraits or headshots done either so like all that stuff was over mm. and uh i got sort of uh, obsessed with taking like the perfect photograph of a crt oh, screen yeah good you know, fucking like, luck yeah. yeah well i mean it's pretty hard but uh yeah. you know i was i was really trying to get the the color right and everything so i was already obsessed with uh, calibrating displays anyway. So I was like, okay, we're going to figure out how to, uh, you know, white balance the screen. We're going to, you know, calibrate the camera to the screen and make sure everything's playing nice. And then we're going to get it into, you know, Lightroom or Photoshop or whatever and, and see what we can do. And I've had some success, but it, 
tinkering with that stuff was about the same time that Dan Mons posted his original color theory videos on his YouTube channel and how to use, you know, a X right color monkey display and color ACFR to white balance CRTs. And I was like, I'm all in. Let's go. Mm -hmm. I think I messaged him almost immediately. Like, what do I buy? What do I need? <laughs> and uh, so I kind of went to the, to the races with that. Um, but getting obsessed with getting the calibration right on the CRT is where I started to realize where things fell short in 240p test suite. You know, like trying to do convergence with the old grid didn't make any sense uh, because the outside border was all red. It's like, how are you supposed to judge if your convergence is good in the corners if there's only one color? Mm. You know, so I was talking to Artemio about that. I'm like, I've got these ideas about kind of what we need to evaluate the performance of the CRT based on all these tests, like all these diagrams and all these service manuals. Like, you know, if this is misbehaving in this way, you make this adjustment, you know, there's all these certain little things you have to do and you have to do them in a certain order. And it was nice to kind of imagine what the test pattern needed to be to reveal all of those flaws all at the same time on one screen. So you could make those, judgments uh reasonably well with you know something like a super nintendo or or a wii actually currently i mean i like the dreamcast version too but i think my favorite's the wii version hmm. is that just because um, it could handle multiple resolutions easier or well multiple resolutions and it has an easy native component so if you have uh you know some consumer tvs that only have component in that's fine um but if you're calibrating an l5 the basis for that is always the component input first mm. um so but those are really the low level things like uh when you're setting the screen g2 like and stuff like that you have to do it with an oscilloscope and you have to have a certain kind of thing but it's always the component input it's the basis that's where it starts huh. there um so we were chatting about that sort of over a, a few weeks and uh, I think at the time I had picked up some work, you know, just house sitting for somebody that was out of town. And uh, I was just basically in a alien environment where I didn't have all my usual distractions. And uh, I'd gone to the store and just bought a bunch of graph paper. And I started taping it together until I could actually come up with a full 256 by 224 grid on graph paper. To simulate huh. the uh, Super Nintendo's output and started drawing that thing by hand on graph paper. And I still have it, actually. I still have the original graph paper kind of rolled up in storage. Um, that is nuts. If you, do you like, Did you snap a picture of that just for your own, like, uh, it you know? I feel like it should be on my Twitter if I look back far enough in time. And I should have digital photos of, like, the process where I had it laid out on, like, this person's dining room table. And, yeah, you uh, gotta send me a picture of that. I'll use that as the background of your thumbnail here. <laughs> right, right. Um, yeah, I'll have to dig it up because uh, I should have some photographs I can send you. But I still have the original graph, and I only I like at first I did a prototype. It was like a quarter of the size, mm -hmm. and then I used that. I only did like a quarter of it to kind of prove that like everything was gonna fit, and then then I blew that up to like one to one pixel mapping to make sure everything was going to fit the way I wanted to. There was going to be symmetrical that everything was going to kind of work out. And yeah, I mean, I think if we rolled it out and looked at it now, probably not completely finished. I was like uh, penciling it in and then doing Sharpie to make the decisions on kind of where everything was going. And, uh, you know, at some point um, I sort of proved like all this is going to work and it's going to fit. And then, uh, and then I had to just, you know, bite the bullet and, download uh probably gimp or something in order to actually draw it in a computer so i could send it to artemio he did all the programming at that point you know he's going to slot in that uh array and program it however he does that for super nintendo or for whatever system so that's how we got started and we were trying to tackle all the different systems and i had to basically draw a new pattern for every system because all the outputs are different you know, the requirements are different. The capabilities are different. So, so when you say a new, a new pattern for each system, so for something like, um, 
NES 256 and SNES mm-hmm. 256. Would that use the same pattern? That would be different? that would be the same. Okay. Um, but now, Genesis 320 and Genesis 256 are the two well, two different ones. As far as I know, the Genesis 256 and the Super Nintendo 256 are identical. It's okay. the same output. It's the same uh, Texas Instruments chip, basically. So mm. whatever that uh, whatever that chip is that was in the Master System is also in the Super Nintendo for that sort of thing. And so it draws the same image at the same resolution with the same dot clock. So um, the only thing I had to do different for the Genesis was draw a whole new one that was 320 by 224 and um, make sure I got the – I had – usually I have like a generic grid, and there's always some little extra thing that's sort of compensated for whatever the dot clock is so that once it's displayed by the original hardware – um, it would come out looking as a perfect square, something like that, or at least have nice. the same height, height and width that's compensated. So for a uh, Genesis, actually interesting, the math uh, between the Genesis 320 by 224, Super Nintendo 256 by 224, after all the analog stuff is done and it's actually outputting from the system to the TV, the width is exactly the same. Huh, to nice. like six decimal points. So <laughs> like there's, I mean, it's, it's basically the same size. So a Genesis 320 resolution is actually just thinner slices of the same size pie, essentially. It's an interesting way to, to verbalize that. I think it's, uh, it's kind of neat visualizing it that way now. But, yeah. you know, the, the dumb end user interpretation of that is basically yeah. just load up your monoscope pattern and you know, use your geometry till it fits fine and then measure with the caliper to make sure the circle's still a circle in the middle. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's the, that's the, that's the hope you can use it. I mean, whatever I, I use just tape measures, like a seamstress's taste tape measure, you know, like a flexible tape measure to do some of those measurements. Cause it'll go across the curvature of the uh, CRT without any issue uh, uh, or flexible. I've had some clear plastic flexible rulers that, mm. uh, that I bought at, like an art supply store. Those are great for actually getting your linearity right. Like if your scrolling's like not even. Yes. Um, that drives uh, me having crazy. One of those. When you're scrolling, it almost looks like the screen's going back and forth, or you know, yeah, uh, well, deep and out as it's going left to right. I guess. Yeah. Right. Well, left to right's really hard to fix. Uh, vertical scrolling, if it's compressing in some way, you there's usually some sort of service menu thing to fix that vertical linearity. Uh, horizontal linearity strictly. As a separate setting, you're only going to see usually in BVMs because the deflection yoke's sophisticated enough to have those sorts of controls. Hmm. But if there's a scrolling problem horizontally in an older CRT, I don't know how to fix it. Somebody smarter probably does. It's probably some inductor or something. But yeah, so I have adopted my an opinion expertise. on this. And, you know, yeah. my opinions are always just what I'm based on today, I, I could change my opinion by the end of this conversation, but mm-hmm. I just kind of love CRTs for what they are. Mm-hmm. And while I do take the time to do basic calibration, I don't obsess too much just because it's almost an unwinnable battle. And I think sometimes I think eventually trying to get CRT emulation onto something like an OLED with BFI is mm-hmm. going to eventually at some point be the better option because you'd never have to worry about geometry issues ever. Right. And right, it's right, just right. a matter of, you know, replicating the CRT mask and scaling it properly. So, yeah, well, I usually treat it almost in reverse. So the idea is that I'll take a pass at calibrating a CRT and how it fails tells me what's wrong. Yeah. So I'll use that to pinpoint like, Oh, this is doing this certain thing. That's not right. Generally, I know where in the circuit that's happening, and then I can zero in on what might be going wrong. Um, yeah, that makes sometimes sense. Sometimes it's just a calibrating calibration setting problem, uh, mm-hmm. but sometimes it'll actually reveal failures in the circuit. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I've shotgun recapped a couple of consumer CRTs just because right. I didn't want to have to do that. <laughs> yeah. and I was like, it'll take me two Saturdays to make a cap list, and then another, you know, one Saturday to make a capitalist, one Saturday to uh, mm-hmm. in order them, and the next one to actually do the replacement. As long as I don't screw anything up, I'd rather start from there and then say, okay, what, where do I go? But a consumer CRT's caps way different than a PVM or BVM. There's much fewer, 
and yeah. a lot of them are obviously the audio circuit, some other stuff. Yeah. So it's because they scrunch down overall. a bunch of those discrete circuits down into ICs, you know, on one yeah. board. You know, uh, one of the big eye-opening things I had early on was um, uh, kind of my first the oscilloscope. It's kind of like a rinky-dink old analog scope. It was fine, um, and I got a lot out of it. But someone had brought me a twenty thirty hmm. PVM twenty thirty that they had bought from WGN. It's one of the like hometown local broadcasters in Chicago. Mm -hmm. And uh, he got it when they cleaned out all their analog stuff years ago, but they had identified something wrong with the monitor. They put a brand new tube in and then just put it in a closet and it just sat there. So it had had a tube swap performed on it and it never had its sort of tube swap calibration that you have to do. you change tubes there's a bunch of stuff you have to do to it to get it kind of up and running so i did all that stuff for him but there was still a problem and it was like the first time i actually isolated an issue with an oscilloscope it was um a ca bad cap in the input board for mm. the rgb connector the red signal um right at the beginning when it hits the input there's a diode that juices the signal up a little bit and it's supposed to get smoothed out by a an electrolytic cap that had dried out. So you see it on the scope, the little red waveform went, had this big wang on it. And, uh, you know, you I started at the neck board and traced my way all the way back to the input board before I found, you know, like, oh, on the one side of this cap, it's fine. And on the other side of this cap, it's monkey. <laughs> so uh, let's change that cap. I changed it and everything was perfect after that. That's awesome. Yeah, that's... It was one of my uh, early lessons in, read the service manual and do what it says because you're supposed to do a lot of the white balance stuff for that with the composite input and uh and i kept trying to white balance composite is uh is the messiest so if you get white balance right on that it's going to be fine on the rest because you've already cal uh, compensated for yeah the color well I mean, the interesting failure with that particular monitor was because the red channel only was messed up mm. when you fed in an rgb signal like it was just always going to be wrong no matter what you did. Um, but when you feed in a composite signal, you turn the color volume all the way down until it's black and white. Then all you've got is Luma. You know, the color killer circuit kicks in, the entire color processing gets turned off, and then all you have is Luma. And then you can white balance based just on Luma. Uh, same way as uh, even though like it's still true up to the L5. You know, when you do the white balance for that, you're supposed to take the Y cable from the component plug it in, nothing else, and then hmm. put the monochrome mode on and then do your white balance. That way the white balance is uh, completely independent of all the color processing. And then you finish that, there's actually offsets to correct the color processing. And then if you're still having problems, then you know there's something wrong in the color processing circuit, not to the RGB amplifiers. Huh, that's pretty neat. That's a, yeah. that's a pretty cool way to approach that. Is that it's like a lot common more knowledge? <laughs> It's a yeah. lot more work. I could only imagine. Um, now you mentioned that you spent some time taking pictures of CRTs, and that's something that's uh, very near and dear to my heart because mm -hmm. that's that was the catalyst for really proving that some of these mods made a difference on these consoles. Because sure, at the course. time, I had no idea how... I, I didn't go down the rabbit hole of color compression and scaling and capture cards, mm -hmm. setting phase and all that stuff. So mm -hmm. I would take captures of before and after and they would look identical but i would set up my pvm i would get my dslr at the time get everything you know as, as sharp as i could possibly do it and the, 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 it's very clear the difference between the two and mm -hmm. getting still pictures of crts was just really a combination of f-stop focus and iso settings and stuff like that mm -hmm. but video has been a nightmare have you yeah, tried video I mean... of crts Video's not my specialty. I've seen some guys do some really interesting stuff with video. Uh, there's also a YouTube channel that I've referenced for some repair stuff. It's a um, a guy that worked in broadcast stuff, I think, in Canada, I think. It's 12 Volt Vids is the name of the YouTube channel. Sounds familiar. Um, his... He would have uh, he would make videos of working on CRTs and the CRT screen always looked perfect. And his assertion was that he was using an old um, sort of TV studio level camera 
that had uh, CCD sensors instead of CMOS sensors, and that's what made the difference. So huh. if you find like an old Nikon that has a CCD sensor instead of a CMOS sensor, you might have a better time. Um, I am writing that down. <laughs> but that's, I mean, you like you'll you'll have to. The only downside to his YouTube channel is that he may have two thousand videos on there, and they're not sorted at all. So oh, good yeah. luck mucking through there trying to find the CRT specific videos because he, he fixes all kinds of stuff like VCRs and tape decks and flat panel TVs and stuff like that. Yeah, the so, couple of videos I've seen are, are VCRs, I think. So I'm yeah. definitely familiar with the channel, and I didn't even I didn't even know he, he worked on CRTs to be honest with mm-hmm. you, but. That's interesting because um, in all of my beating my head against the wall, what I think it needs to be is uncompressed color. So 444, not 422, mm-hmm. not 420. Mm-hmm. Got to use good glass. So a full frame sensor for a mm-hmm. modern camera would be almost required. But then the final kicker was a lot of people who I saw who were incorporating this into, I have a Netflix documentary and there's a CRT in the background and it looks like shit. How do I do that? They get the way they fix the moray pattern is a combination of painstaking setup and then fixing it in post. And that's where I would have zero clue on how to do that. And I mentioned it to uh, to a couple of friends of mine who are pretty good at this stuff. And both of them were like, you're not trying to do this, are you? And I'm like, I don't I think it's over my head. And they're like, thank <laughs> fucking God, because I don't want to have to walk you through it. It'd be days just trying to get you started. So that just be, might be one of those things where, you know. And I, re- I remember hearing about a specialized piece of equipment for movie makers when they have CRTs on set that actually change the frame rate of the CRTs to match the shutter of the camera so that it always looks right. So, so you I've actually seen turn that. the CRT in like a 24p output and then you synchronize it with uh, some sort of cable to the camera and then the camera basically gets a clean shot every single time and always looks right. I've seen stuff like that. I didn't think it was 24p. I think it just synced it to the exact refresh rate of the CRT. And I've yeah. seen the cones that went from, I had one, I gave one to Mark from My Life in Gaming. It went from mm-hmm. that you clipped it onto the lens of the camera and then you push it up against the curvature of the tube so to block out all ambient light. Mm-hmm. And I tested with all of it. And I still got a really bad moray pattern. And I know everybody says, yeah, oh, just, you know, one's just definitely focus one past it. Yeah, that's yeah. really great if you want an artistic shot of a CRT in the background of your video. Sure, that'll work yeah. fine. But what I'm trying to do is get, I'm trying to do a couple of things. I'm trying to first and foremost, get good enough video so that if you watch this on an OLED, you could actually start to get a sense of why we like these things. Because mm-hmm. I mean, zero disrespect when I say this, but you and I could sit here for hours and explain to people why CRTs might sometimes be better. If you don't see it with your own eyes, you'll never know what the hell we're talking about. No, 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 no. you'll see it in person. Yeah. Yeah. It's just one of those things. So I'm trying to get a good representation. And of course, the other side of it is I really, really want to see accurate CRT and maybe even projector emulation on 120 hertz and heck, maybe even 240 hertz TVs. What what lenses did have you tried? On those whatever my should, broke ass could fucking afford <laughs> i got a gh5 with a what, uh, a lumix okay. prime lens and uh, okay. i i love prime lenses for this exact mm-hmm. reason you could spend 700 bucks on a prime lens that looks like a two thousand dollar zoom lens so yeah yeah actually uh i wonder because i have um canon mm-hmm. ef bodies um, okay so i've just been collecting ef lenses one of my favorite old lenses is the 80 to 200 2.8 L lens. It was the original one made in like 95. Mm. So it was like the lens Canon used to steal all the professional photographers from Nikon. Wow. Uh, they called it the magic drain pipe. And uh, if you do those really long, like telephoto, like 200 millimeter shots, like, and it's 12 feet away from the CRT, um, it might actually flatten uh, the curvature of the, uh, the screen the a little farthest bit. I've gone. So my friend Destiny let me borrow a black magic camera and she had a really nice Canon zoom lens. When mm-hmm. I say really nice, really nice for me, probably not really nice for you or for somebody who does, you know, who shoots movies for a living. But um, and I try it was uh, 20 feet away, I think maybe 15 mm-hmm. feet away. And it was zero mm-hmm. difference. And zero I definitely difference. tried that in my apartment in uh, New York City. I don't think the thing was 20 feet long, so it must have been 10, 15 feet tops. 
mm-hmm. and I, I couldn't get the lighting right. So I was like, screw it. Let me just leave all of the you know reflections in it. And let me just check the moray. Mm-hmm. And that didn't really do anything either. I also tried a macro lens, both close and at a distance. Same mm-hmm. thing. So yeah. I just picked up a macro lens and I haven't had a chance to experiment with photographing CRTs with it yet. Um, but just, thing just to be clear, do, though, in all of those tests, I don't think any of them were lossless 444 color compression on there. I think all of mm-hmm. them were at, at best 422. So that right. could have been it. Maybe if I had a zoom lens and a full frame camera with no color compression, then mm-hmm. maybe that would have been the solution. Yeah, and we're still talking. Yeah, I'm thinking I'm still thinking about shooting stills and you're talking about shooting video and there's definitely different limitations there. Yeah, but, stills. Uh, I I'm able to get uh, to get no more on stills all yeah. the time. Sometimes yeah. it's just a slightly longer exposure. You know, uh, it just that's. I don't want to say it's easy, but compared to video, it's easy. It's still a pain in the yeah. ass taking good shots yeah. of CRTs. Yeah, one of the tricks was actually using a level to perfectly level the CRT, and then use the level oh. in the camera to perfect perfectly level the camera, and then that way that, you're I'm not leave getting, myself that note too. <laughs> uh, if you can sort of get the level of the camera and the level of the CRT right, then the scan lines won't be crooked. They won't be hitting different pixels on the sensor. Like you mm. can get it straight across. That might help some of your moray. Um, That's a good idea. But the rest of the moray is coming from the vertical. Like the, the phosphors are mm. basically vertical stripes. Um, so I wonder, have, what resolution are you shooting at? So I was originally shooting at 1080p 60, then I got 4K 60 cameras, and then mm. Cousin Scott, I think, suggested, why don't I try that 4K 60 camera at 1080p 60 to see if that's something, and it's the same thing. Good suggestion. Okay. I mean, ideally, I... right, in a, in a perfect world, if we could ever figure this out, I would love the highest resolution, most professional shots that we just take once. <laughs> I would mm-hmm. upload it, you know, free domain somewhere, you know, I'd pay, mm-hmm. I, I'm sure there are friends out there that would help uh, sponsor hosting for these massively large files that we would have to upload. But, you know, I would love to get an 8K 240 camera to do this all at or something. Right. So. I wonder if it's even shooting lower res though. Like, I wonder if the most of the noise goes away if you shot it like 640 by 480 or something like that. Yeah, but there that kills both of the needs. It's not yeah. a good representation for you to watch on your OLED, and it would be right. a horrible time having, you know, trying to scale that up so that Mike mm-hmm. could sit there and try to recreate that pattern in the retro tank. Up or the retro tank. yeah, well, I think if you got the if you got the Mac the the sensor and the CRT matched so that the more A disappeared, you'd probably end up having to stuff to crop away, you know, yeah. whatever that resolution is that you're actually like using on that big sensor. Um, hmm. I don't know. That's a good. That's an interesting problem. Yeah, it's uh, it's one I'd love to someday solve. And that's um, you know, I've been talking about making this getting started video for like three years now. And mm-hmm. you know, while yes, part of it's laziness because I know it's going to be a hundred hours minimum to do this crap. But it's mm-hmm. also because I just, what's the point if people don't still don't get it, right? Right. In order for me to make this video and get you to understand why we do the things we do, you'd already have to have half a foot in the door. You'd already yeah. decided, I think I might want to play older video games. And, uh, you know, CRTs are kind of cool. Maybe that's nostalgic or something. You'd already have to get your foot in the door. Whereas I really wanted this to be like, why the hell do you people do this? And then I watch this <laughs> video and that, that's, that's the answer to your question. So. I think, I, well, I guess I always figured that lag was the foot in the door. It's like, it's the, you know, the Smash Bros tournaments oh, or whatever where like everyone's yeah. carrying in a 14 inch tv and they're in you know in 64 or whatever and that's just yeah. the way it's done and lag is still at some flat earth levels of bullshit on <laughs> on both sides but sure and it's the the other thing that i've been running into forever is tournament organizers who just wish i would instantly be struck by lightning and die because they slap together you know a bunch of pc monitors and mm-hmm. they, you know, they found PC monitors with analog inputs and analogs zero lag, right? And they set up all of these stations and now they have people come in and here I come in making all these videos that shows why that is the worst thing that you could do. Here's all the latency. Here's all the bad processing. Mm-hmm. So, and 
instead of just being like, hey, I'm doing my best. This is all I could afford. It's Bob's lying. He's just trying to clout chase for attention. Lag isn't an issue. He's just one. It's like, you know, I've had I've had that. I've had those attacks since I started this thing. And I've had my friends get attacked for this. And it's it's rough. So while you're yeah. right, that's one. That's the exact same thing that I was saying. And that somebody has to already understand what lag is to yeah. understand that the CRT is the better choice. So Well, I definitely had the 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 definitive petri dish you know visiting some family during the holidays where they had their we outputting composite to some weird composite to hdmi Mm -hmm. upscaler that was juicing it up to 1080p and then displaying that on a sony 4k television (laughs) yeah and which by uh, the way if you've ever used those with like vcrs yeah. yeah, that's that. They give a high five for that. You know, that $20 yeah. adapter doesn't make yeah. a VCR look like a Blu-ray, but holy crap, what a great buy for that. Yeah. Um, but not for video games. It was not Mario Kart was interesting on yeah. that. Uh, My favorite was a friend who had uh, just gotten a new TV. This is 10 plus years ago. TV didn't have a game mode at all not even buried mm-hmm. in the menus mm-hmm. and I, I had built a wii for him and he's like oh i can't wait to play super mario brothers i loved that game growing up and i, I played it i'm like geez the lag is horrible but i feel so bad he just dropped a lot of money on this tv and mm-hmm. he starts playing it and he's like is the controller sticky i'm like it's a brand new controller but that's how he described the latency mm-hmm. is the controller yeah. sticky and i'm like that's a yeah. brilliant way to describe what, like, what bad lag is like so. yeah i mean i even in my early days of like the, the growing pains of transitioning, like getting a PlayStation three, getting like, you know, the first flat panel TV I bought was a Vizio. The second one I bought was actually a much better choice. It was a six series Samsung back when the six series was the flagship. So Hmm. the LN 52, a 650, you know, it was probably a $3,500 TV when it was brand new. I got it on clearance for like 18. Mm, Um, Nice. But its game mode was actually horrific because it locks all the calibration down. You can't actually calibrate it if its game mode's turned on. So you actually have to use the HDMI 2 as a PC input, and that drops it from like 110 milliseconds down to 25. So that's as good as it gets. But you know, I'll tell you, when you're, playing, other when you're playing Dark Souls at 110 milliseconds of latency, it's a lot harder. <laughs> Yeah. So yes, 25 milliseconds felt like easy mode. I actually beat the game when I uh, figured out what I was doing wrong and fixed that. So have you played with um, with CRT emulation, like the RetroTink 5X and stuff on, on modern TVs? I don't, to try to I don't have one. How it looks? Oh, you don't? Um, Get the fuck off of this podcast. That, no, I'm kidding. Why, you Mike, know, why Mike would you can, have one if you have Mike CRT? Mike can send me one. That's what he can do. <laughs> um Actually, I was just teasing him the other day because of the, uh, you know, the grandma and grandpa situation. I was like, we need, we need an adapter that just fixes the Wii, <laughs> like one yeah. input, one output. You know. Yeah, I, I mean, I spend three hundred dollars on grandma and grandpa's, you know, Wii. Yeah, and I think that stuff is all down the coming down the line at some sure. point, but you know, it's going to solve the, the bigger problems first. But I don't, yeah. I don't just want to see the next retro tank. For video games i want to see it for tv and movies too and mm-hmm. you know adding how to manipulate 24 frame per second images is, is you know the an endless debate that we've been talking about forever but you mentioned something before that kind of it, it annoyed me not what you said but the the subject of how when some of the content that you're watching gets changed to 60 hertz from depending on the display you still mm-hmm. get as if like soap opera effect was on and i think my projector might do that and I, hmm. I got to figure out, and I checked, it doesn't have many settings, so I got to check for another firmware update. So I got to try that again. I got to set my OPPO Blu-ray player to 24, 4K24, and then 4K60, and let the OPPO do the conversion and see if mm-hmm. I can tell a difference. Because, you know, that stuff drives me nuts. And that's that alone is a reason for movie lovers to pick up the next tank. If they're using 1080p Blu-rays into that, you know, you could do 24p stuff. You know, if, if Mike decides that he wants to spend the yeah. time adding it, maybe it's just crazy people like us who would want it. But and then what about BFI? What if you're able to uh, insert frames, so 24 frames per second into 120? You know, or, or heck, could yeah. you even do BFI? Uh, you know, 24. I guess you would have to st- 
you'd have to stretch the frame out basically. But you know, if you split that up into uh, black, one black frame and one regular frame, that would be really flickery though. That would be a little too flickery. Well, I, think. I mean, th- that was, I think that how we got onto this co- conversation in the first place was the other day based on something I'd read, you know, ages ago about how a film projector actually works. Um, you shoot 24, you record 24 frames a second, but then when you project it, each one of those frames gets tripled. So you actually yeah. have the same frame, one, two, three, on the film strip. And then as it runs through the camera, there's a shutter spinning that blacks it out every time right. the film advances. So you're getting frame on, off, on, off, on, off. That's one. Right. Technology one Connections just did a really, really great video about that too. If anybody's interested, I'll. I'll I should look that up because I want. I wanted to make sure I wasn't just talking out of my ass. It was just no, you, some dumb you shit nailed on the it. Internet, you know, years ago. I'm but, positive there's going to be an actually in the comments about how yeah. some projectors do or don't. But you get the basic theory is there. So, yeah, but, being able to to triple the frames with mm-hmm. a black frame in between, I think, mm-hmm. would be an excellent way to do it. I'd also just love to see it in sixty frames per second. Um, like that and just deal with the blur and see how flickery it actually is. Is it going to yeah. be epilepsy it's inducing? balancing or the it... uh, persistence of vision with your uh, ability to deal with the, I guess, the flickering maybe, mm. uh, to get the, the sense of motion, the, the illusion of motion correct. That's how they solved it for film. Mm. So like I, what, what I was, the point I was trying to make on Twitter was, if a TV company is going to solve that problem once and for all, it's probably going to look like a 144 hertz panel that can do three on, three off for each frame of 24p mm. content. Because then you're simulating a film projector at that point. That should, as far as I know, fix the problem. Now the question is, how bright does that panel have to get? You know, three on, three off to still hit like a thousand nits in HDR. I don't know. Right. But I think the new, I think the 2023 line of panels have the potential to do that. And if uh, the LG OLEDs that are supposedly coming out this year are extremely bright, I don't know if they do 144 hertz, but the Samsungs do, the QD Mm -hmm. OLEDs. I think I was just watching that HD, uh, HDTV, uh, the the dude who lives in England who does all the really great reviews on flat panels. I forgot the Uh, name. Vincent. Is it Vincent? Yes, yes, yes. Vincent TL, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I love that guy. So he feels like one of us, right? Yeah, he's always <laughs> he's always funny. I always like it. Yeah. Um, I don't. I think it was him and maybe a couple other guys that were actually talking about these weird regulations in Europe that were going to stymie AK TVs and power consumption in general. Um, Which is hilarious because first gen plasmas mm-hmm. would bring people's power bills up. And yeah. it's so funny because everybody thought CRTs drew more power. But I remember I convinced my my boss to let me borrow his uh, 1280 by 1280 plasma TV, a 50 inch, I think, mm-hmm. for testing stuff at home. And at the end of that month, my power bill was like twenty, thirty dollars higher. I'm like, mm-hmm. what? Did I leave something on? What? And that's when I realized, like, oh, I think that's way higher power consumption. Yeah. So interesting. But yeah, we'll see. I don't know. I don't like the regulations for stuff like that because how many people leave their TVs on 24-7? You know what I mean? Nobody. Nobody does. Um, I mean, I don't know where that's coming from except their general... Well, I mean, besides Germany just dropping the ball on their energy production in general, they're going to have problems this Mm. winter and next year, so we'll see how they handle it, but making everyone suffer probably isn't the right answer. (laughs) Yeah. You know, if I'm going to drop that much money on a TV, I want it to be as best as possible, not stifled because of something yeah. else, you know? Yeah. Oh, well. Well, we'll see how that plays out. Uh, yeah. I so don't know well, if that means that, you know, development gets forked and, you know, and we just get better TVs in America because they're stymied. They're like gimped for the European market in some way. Um, I think what that might, what would have to be is firmware. Yeah. Um, unfortunately though, it doesn't always work that way. Cause if you ever had a DSLR that shuts off recording video after 20 minutes, mm-hmm. that's because of that stupid regulation that camcorders get taxed differently. Yeah. And that's just the EU thing. And yeah. you would think that they would have just solved that with a firmware, but they crippled the whole planet with that. So right. you never right. know. 
So what, what other projects you got going on? You just kind of uh, dabbling and nerding out in the scene, like uh, you know, like we've been talking about. You working on anything else? A little bit. I mean, I we've got some new developments in 240p test suite that I need to get more involved in. Uh, it's just been the holidays and busy, and you know, uh, they've been concentrating on. Not to speak out of turn, I don't know if our team has talked about it or not, but Neo Geo and oh yeah, it's public. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah Dustin dustin has been working uh, yeah. on, on that with our Teamio and everything. Yeah, yeah, it's public, but uh, I haven't made too big a splash about it because I just respectfully I don't like to play some of that stuff up too much to get everybody hyped. So that then they're knocking down Artemio and Dustin's door going, where's the thing? Right. And it's like, no, nah, I like to hype it, but I like to blow it up when it's already available for everybody. Well, it's, it's sort of like um, fan translations of Nintendo games. It's like, don't announce that. Just release yeah. it. And then they can't stop you. Yeah. Yeah, that too. Yeah, it, it, on both sides. You know, people yeah. don't people aren't going, where the heck's the rest of the translation? Not realizing that it takes a gazillion hours to properly translate. And right. also, you're right. If it's already out there, if the ROM's out there, what's Nintendo going to do? Yeah. Well, I mean, if you... Exactly. Yeah. If you say you're going to make it, Nintendo knocks on your door, then you have to stop. But if yeah. it just gets out in the wild, we're like, oh, I don't know what happened. It, somebody must have translated that. It must have been somebody else. Oh, I pressed the auto translate button and the ROM somehow got distributed across. I'm sorry, Nintendo. My bad. <laughs> yeah, cool. Well, this was a this was a fun chat. Um, you know, let's uh let, let's try to get you some scalers and a, a QD yeah, OLED. Right, and maybe. We'll, we'll swing back around next year and see uh, see if we can try to tweak this stuff to make CRT emulation a little bit better. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm going to be thinking about your video problem. I think for a little while. And see, yeah, uh, any help that you could uh, assist with on that, I would be really appreciative. And if you, if you wanted to shoot some stuff too with your equipment, and we can kind of go over it and see, I think it'd be, a, be yeah. a lot of fun. I mean, my CRT selection isn't the best, but it's you pretty have more good. More than one, so there you I've go. I've got a <laughs> BVM nineteen eleven and a fourteen L five and a thirteen forty two Q. Those are the ones that basically work. The 19 is the one you're going to want to mess with because yeah. when you start taking video of the scan line mask on the smaller CRTs, it's really, really hard to do that yeah. without still images and and mm -hmm. stuff. So, yeah. So I would just use the 19 inch and you should be good to go. Okay. Well, I'll experiment with it. Sweet. Well, this was a hell of a lot of fun. Thank you very much, yeah. Keith. I really Thanks appreciate this. And, uh, yeah, let's follow up next year when we can try to make, uh, make film look like film on the flat panels. <laughs> we'll see what we can do. Awesome. Thank you.